All right, today's message is going to be comfort for grieving Christians. Uh, recently, the uh, we've been attending. My wife and I have been attending a, a little Baptist church uh, out in the country here, and uh, one of the women of the church, her sister, has a granddaughter, and this little granddaughter, nine-month-old little girl, died in her sleep just the other day, and. The family's a saved family. They're they're both Christians, and and uh, the question comes up: Why would God allow that to happen? Why would God take this little nine-month-old girl uh, home to be with Him? And we are going to see later on here in the study that she did go home to be with the Lord. She's in heaven right now, and I'm going to prove that from Scripture. But the question comes up: When you have a Christian, a saint that dies. The question comes up, why? Uh, you know, of course, you have a. Uh, my grandfather died at 98 years of age. Well, there wasn't really much of a question as to why. Uh, we knew that he was going to die. He was his health was failing over the years, and and uh, he did eventually die, and and he had lived a very good life. But uh, when you have a a saint, a Christian that's younger, or especially a little child that dies, that you know. A lot of times it's kind of, why would that happen? So I'm going to show you today from the Bible uh, verses of comfort for grieving Christians. Now let me just say right here at the outset that if you're not saved, this sermon is not for you. If you are lost, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I can tell you that death is something that you should fear. You should be very afraid of death because if you are lost and you die in your sins, your nightmare is just beginning. You're going to go to a place that the Bible calls hell, and you're going to burn forever down there. Uh, you can listen to my sermon on the terrors of hell if you want proof that hell is a real place, and that the Bible does teach that, in spite of what the liberal uh, theologians try to say now. But let's start out here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13-14. through 14. It says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Okay, now you see there in verse 13, it says, even as others which have no hope. Now, as I previously stated, if you are lost and you die in your sins, you have no hope. And if you have a lost or a, a loved one who died and they're lost, you're not going to see them again until the great white throne judgment. That's where you're going to see them again, and they have no hope. There's no chance of them getting saved after they die. That's why your prime responsibility in life, uh, listener, is to get to know God the Creator and get to know His plan for salvation, which is Jesus Christ. The blood that He shed on the cross at Calvary, that is your main responsibility. And if you don't meet God at the cross, then you're missing out on life. You're missing out on what life is about. And you say, well, the majority of people don't believe in Jesus Christ. Well, that's what the Bible teaches, that the majority of people, the, the road to hell is very broad and many there be which go in there at. Okay, if you are lost today, then you are the one that's described there in verse 13. You are one of the others which have no hope. But I just, I wanted to start out with that because a lot of times these modern preachers are preaching promises for Christians and they're just making it for Christians or lost people. And that's not true. Uh, that's, they're deceivers. They're after your money. And I'm not after your money. Okay, I'm not going to deceive you. I'm going to be very honest with anybody that's listening. So the rest of this message here is going to be for the saved people. The people that says there that, you know, Paul says we're not to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not. You know, as a Christian, there's going to be some grief when you lose a, a saved loved one. Of course there will be. You know, it wouldn't be natural, especially if they die young. There'll be a little bit of grief there, but you shouldn't live the rest of your life in grief and sorrow. I remember hearing a story the one time about how that uh, 
Abraham Lincoln, when he lost his son, he was crying and crying and crying. And, and I think it was Charles Chiniqui, the converted Catholic priest, that actually said to him that you need to stop acting like a pagan. And Abraham Lincoln kind of was shocked and looked at him and he said, what are you talking about? And he said, he quoted verse 13 there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and he said, you are to sorrow not. As a Christian, you have hope. You have a blessed hope that that lost, saved, loved one is going to be in heaven and that you're going to see him again someday. And that's very, very true, very profound. You should not be crying and weeping and everything over a lost loved one if they're saved and you know that they're saved. Okay, a little bit okay, but if you're crying and weeping and weeping for months on end, eh, there's a problem there. You don't know your Bible that well. But it's interesting because Christians are really the only ones who really honestly can say that they know where their saved loved ones go at death. A Catholic, well, if you're a Catholic, if you die in a state of grace, you might make it to heaven after spending time burning in purgatory. <laughs> what a wonderful promise. And I mean, I've read things where they say that, that the popes probably will have to go to purgatory for a little while to be purified in the flames. Absolutely absurd and ridiculous. I mean, what a, what a blessing to know that after death you're going to go burn for a while. You know, it's ridiculous. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. And that blood is something that's spiritual. It comes on you at salvation. It washes your sins away. It's not, you know, fermented grape juice that you drink at the Mass every week and then eat a little cookie and pretend that it's Jesus Christ. That's pagan nonsense. What about Islam? Well, there again, you might make it to heaven if you kill enough infidels and die in jihad. <laughs> you know, holy war. But it's interesting, even Muhammad didn't know if he was going to be in heaven when he died. You say, what's the proof? Well, the Hadith, Burkhari, Volume 5, Number 266 says, quote, The Prophet said, By Allah, even though I am the Apostle of Allah, yet I do not know what Allah will do to me. End quote. Now that's reading right from their holy scriptures. And Muhammad said, I have no idea what Allah is going to do to me when I die. To paraphrase it there. He didn't even know. See, he was one that didn't have hope when he died. All right? He's not a Christian. He's not saved. Muhammad is in hell, burning, along with all of his little Islamic followers. What about Buddhism and Hinduism? Well, you might be reincarnated again if you do enough good works. And you come back as something nice, you know. If you're bad, you'll come back as a slug, and if you're good, you'll come back as a butterfly or something stupid. You know, they teach reincarnation. And if you reincarnate enough times and you have enough good karma, well, then you can become part of the universe, or, you know, or become a god or something like this. Nonsense. <coughs> what about atheism? Well, atheism is you just die and you are buried and you rot away. And there is nothing else. They think, at least. <laughs> they can't prove that because no atheist ever died and came back to tell them about it. And you can't scientifically prove that there's no soul in the body. Okay, so again, all other systems of belief out there, and I'm not going to cover every single one, but all other systems out there teach doubt. Why? Well, what Paul wrote there, we are not as others which have no hope. They have no hope. They don't know for sure what happens after death. But a Christian can know for sure where their saved loved ones go. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Know that ye have eternal life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you can turn there a while. It's interesting, again, how many people out there think that, you know, if I'm good enough or if I do enough good works and things... And I had a guy at the one time say that, well, I've been pretty good. I haven't been too bad in my life. I said, really? Well, let me ask you a question. Why did Jesus die on the cross if you could be good enough to make it into heaven? And boy, he changed that subject real quickly. He didn't answer the question. Why? Well, because he was confronted with his own self-righteousness. He was confronted with him thinking that he's good enough to get to heaven and then 
me bringing up the fact that no, you're not good enough to get to heaven, and God had to send his son to die for your worthless, miserable hide. <laughs> and he didn't like that thought. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle was were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Your body right now is the quote-unquote house that you're living in. This house of this tabernacle. The Bible also says about that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Ghost. Excuse me. Um, and if your body is dissolved, which means you die, then you have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You have eternal life waiting for you where God dwells. Verse 2 here, it says, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. That's an interesting statement right there. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. Say, wait a second. I thought I was alive right now. No, you are dying. If you are alive right now on this earth and listening to the sound of my voice, you are dying. Every day you die a little bit more. You know, you're closer to your death. You know, every, you are born, and then the more you live, the closer you get to death. And the farther away from your birth you, be, you, you know, move. That's just the way it is. Okay? And the mortality that you have right now this life that you're living, you're not going to live forever in this body of flesh. Your real life is going to be in heaven, in eternity. You're going to go to live with the Lord. And that house, quote unquote, that you're going to get when you put on immortality, that's going to be your real body forever. What you have right now, the body that you have right now, I, you know, I know there are a lot of Christians out there that have health problems. There are Christians in wheelchairs, there are Christians that are blind, there are Christians that are deaf and dumb, and all kinds of abnormalities and things. That's because your body is mortal. But the immortal body that you're going to get someday, that one's not going to have any problems. And that one's not going to be you know, prone to sin. That body's going to be perfect. That's the one. And, and when you think about having a body that never has headaches again, never gets a cold again, never gets a fever again, never gets depressed again, never is tempted to sin again, what do you do? You go, oh man, I wish I could have that body right now. What's that? You're groaning. You're saying, oh, I'm so sick and tired of this body. I'm so sick and tired. Oh, man, I got a headache again. You know, it gets kind of depressing down here sometimes. So why is it that we as Christians, when a saved loved one dies and passes away and they go to home to be with the Lord, why is it that we would cry and sorrow down here for them and just be in grief and grief-stricken for months on end? Why would you do that? They're with the Lord. They're in glory. They've received that, that incorruptible body. It's something that we should all desire. And it's not about being suicidal, by the way. It's not about saying, oh, I'm going to blow my brains out so I can go be with the Lord. No, no, no. You have a job to do here, Christian, and your eternal rewards are dependent on what you do in this life. And so get busy for the Lord in the time that you have here and struggle with your flesh the whole way through life. And then, then comes your best life. You know, this incredible idiot, Joel Olstein, comes out and he says, your best life now. What a satanic blasphemy that is to say that. My best life is not right now. You know, my best life is going to be in eternity when I'm with Jesus Christ. And so will yours if you're saved. But let's continue here. Verse 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith not by sight. Now look at verse 8. This is the key here. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You know when you go to a funeral and you see that body of your loved one laying there and you know that they were saved, 
they're not there anymore. That body that you're seeing is just their body of flesh. That's just the shell, that their house that they had here on earth. That's just the mortal body, okay? That thing's going to go into the ground, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be mean here, but it's going to rot. That's not them anymore. Their soul and their spirit are gone. You say, where'd they go? Absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. If you have lost a saved loved one, they're with the Lord right now. You might look at that dead body, and I'm sure I can't even fathom how difficult it would have been for that local couple up here to see the body of their little nine-month-old girl. I can't fathom that. I can't, I, I'm glad the Lord never put me through a thing like that. Uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't understand how difficult that would be to hold the body of your child in your arms and feel it being lifeless. That'd be terrible. What a horrible thing! But you have to understand, they're not there anymore. Their soul and their spirit have gone on to be with the Lord. They are present with Jesus Christ in heaven. Okay, there's no more sorrow up there. There's no more pain up there. But you say, well, what about a baby or young child? How do you know for sure that they go to heaven? Well, turn to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to show you that they are in heaven. They do, in fact, go up there. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 13. It says here, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Is a baby a sinner? Yeah. Because why? Well, because they get their seed from their father. And he got it from his father, and he got it from his father, and you go back far enough, and that seed comes from Adam. You know, another part of the Bible it says, For as in Adam all die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay, you get your seed from Adam, so you are born as a sinner. But let's look at here at verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Can a child understand the laws of the land as soon as they're born? No. Can a child understand the fact that they have sinned against God? a holy, righteous God, when they're nine months old? No. They can understand that, that mommy or daddy's raising their voice or giving me a little spank or something like that, but they don't understand that they've sinned against God. They can't possibly understand that. But what's it say there? It says sin is not imputed when there is no law. You know, if you go to another country or something like that and and or you're someplace and all of a sudden there's a police officer walks up and he says, Hey, what are you doing? And you say, what? What did I do? Well, don't you know that there's a law against doing, you know, walking across that grass or something? And you say, well, I didn't know. Would the police officer be just if he arrested you in spite of the fact that you didn't know that there was a law? No, he'd give you a warning. Okay, well, God's not going to be less just than a police officer. The Lord isn't going to judge somebody if they don't know any better. Now, when you become an adult, when you get older... And, you know, people say the age of accountability, all of a sudden you're old enough to understand, hey, this is wrong. This is, this is bad what I'm doing. I'm sinning against God here. And your conscience starts to come into play and you realize, if I lie, that's a bad thing. If I steal, that's a bad thing. If I, you know, disobey my parents, that's a bad thing. When you get to that age where you can understand that, when that, the law of God starts to take hold in your heart, well, now, if you die, well, you're, now you're going to die in your sins. Okay, if you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ especially, and now all of a sudden, you know, you reject the gospel, and you say, I trust in my own righteousness, and you die, you're going to go to hell. Okay, there's no other way. But a baby, they can't understand that. I mean, a baby does all kinds of stupid things. I mean, they, they go in their pants and, and they don't even have the mind to know better than to do that. A, you know, a little child, a two or three year old, they would live on candy if they could. You know, and make themselves sick and go to the hospital and get out of the hospital and go back and 
eat candy again. You know, the, the children don't have the mind to understand that they are sinning before God. So if a child dies before that age of accountability, before they can understand that they're breaking God's laws, before their conscience is developed, that child, when they die, they go to heaven. They go to be with the Lord. You say, well, could you prove that? Absolutely. Turn in your Bible back to the Old Testament to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. I'm going to look at a story here, and we're not going to go into the whole thing, but basically David, uh, he sees this woman, and he has her husband killed. You can read all the whole story. I'm not even going to go into details, but uh, he lays with her, sleeps with her, you could say, and takes her to be his wife, you know, and, and they have a child together. And after this thing happens, uh, Nathan comes and he judges David. Okay, Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 13 says here, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Now see, in the Old Testament, adultery was a sin that was punishable by death. But the Lord spared David, because David had done a lot of great things for the Lord. And David is a type of a New Testament Christian that has the, the sure mercies of David. The Bible talks about that. That God had an extra measure of grace for David. But notice it says there, uh, David says, I have sinned against the Lord. You see, David had his conscience developed enough where he realized he didn't say, Hey, I sinned against you know the man that was killed and, and his wife, and I sinned against the people here. And he said, I sinned against the Lord. Okay? He realized who he had wronged and who he was accountable to. See, that's proof of a developed conscience. He realized he sinned against God. But Nathan says, you're not going to die. But, look at verse 14, How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Let me stop there for a minute too. One of the worst things that happens when you sin, Christian, and you get caught and be sure your sins will find you out. You say, well, I haven't gotten caught yet. Well, you will. If you are sinning, you'll get caught. But one of the worst things that can happen is it creates a stumbling block. And the lost world goes, ah, look at that Christian. Ah, ha, ha. Little righteous guy there. Look what he just did. See, they blaspheme the Lord because of you, because of your mistake. But continuing here, it says, Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? Okay. Notice there, it does not say David got up after the first day and got something to eat. For seven days, he was laying there on the ground, fasting and, and praying to God and pleading with God, please save my son. Now, you see, there are times, I believe, when a Christian gets to messing around with sin and God, as a punishment, will take away their child. Okay, sometimes that happens. And I don't know what the situation was with this young couple. I don't know them personally. But I know that there are other situations out there where I've heard that. Uh, where they're messing around with sin and the Lord has to take one of their children to straighten them out. And we're going to see later on that that's not like this, you know, God's taken the child and destroyed the child and they'll never see the child again. No, not so. Let's continue here. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 19. 
But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Boy, I wonder if uh, Christians that lose their children, I wonder if they would do that. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. We are not as others which have no hope. We're to sorrow not. Isn't that amazing? You should worship the Lord if you lose a saved loved one. Not complain and say, oh, why, why, God, why, why, why? That stuff's going to go through your head, but your attitude should be one of the Lord knew what he was doing. But let's continue here. Um, then he came to his own house, verse 20 here. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And by the way, let me just, I, I got to keep cutting in here. You know, the Catholics teach that you can have death masses and say masses and say prayers for the dead to get him out of purgatory quicker. Even David had enough sense to know better than that. David didn't say, oh, I have to keep fasting and praying for my son because he's in purgatory now being purified. <laughs> no, he said, oh, why would I pray anymore? Why would I fast anymore? The child's dead. Now look what he says here in the end of verse 23. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Where did David go when he died? David went to heaven. Okay, now he went to Abraham's bosom because he was an Old Testament saint, but then the bodies of the saints which slept arose with Jesus Christ. So where is David right now? He's in heaven. He's not in hell. He's not in some kind of a soul sleep, you know, thing under the earth or something. No, you don't go there anymore. Okay? David is with the Lord. Where did his son go? David said, I will go to him. So his son went to heaven. Well, wait a second. When did the son get saved? The son didn't get saved. The son was a, was a result of a sinful, adulterous relationship and that son was born into sin. He was born as a result of sin. And yet God took him to heaven. Okay? And someday, when if you are saved and you're listening to this, you're going to get to see David and you're going to get to see that son that died there. You'll get to see him. So you say, is there any proof of a child dying and going to heaven? Yeah, right there. Just read it. And you say, well, is there another reason why God might take a child, a loved, uh, beloved child from a saved couple? Well, unfortunately, sometimes the parent's sin is simply not having much of an interest in heavenly things. That can happen too. Sometimes parents can get so worldly that the Lord has to do something to make them think about eternity. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. You can turn there in your Bible. <clears throat> As Christians, we're supposed to think about eternity because that's where it's at. You know, Paul said there that we are to earnestly groan, all right, for the for our body, which is from heaven. But it says here in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, If ye then be risen with Christ, notice the if there, if you're really saved, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You know, one of the most irritating things I think I, I hear of with people is how they just think that life is always just going to go on as it is right now. You know, and I've heard people say, Christians, professing Christians, talk about someday, you know, they'll, they'll say to their kids, I've heard parents say to their children, you know, that are... 11, 12, 13 years old, 
they'll say, someday when you have grandkids, you'll remember this or that. And I'm thinking, huh? Are you so ignorant of the times that we're living in? How close we are to the rapture and the time of Jacob's trouble and the second coming of Jesus Christ and you're telling your, your child someday when you have grandchildren? You know, 50, 60 years down the road, we ain't going to be here in 50, 60 years. Okay? Even if the Lord would decide for some strange reason not to come back in that time period, which I don't think is going to happen, even if that were true, this country isn't going to last another 50 or 60 years. America is about ready to collapse, you know, into the dust heap of, of history. You know, I mean, have some discernment there. Well, what's, what's going on? Well, their, their affections are on things on this earth. They're thinking about having a nice house and having a nice retirement and having a nice, you know, this and a nice that. And a, all the grandkids will come over someday for me and I'll be sitting on my front porch on my rocking chair and blah, 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 blah. What are you doing? Your affections are on things on this earth. I'll tell you right now, you need to have a love for eternity because that's your home. You should be earnestly groaning for that body that you will get one day. That's what you should look for. You know, every time I get sick, every time I'm laying there and I have a migraine headache, you know what I want? I am earnestly groaning at that point in time for my heavenly, immortal body that I'm going to get. I can't wait for it. But, you know, there's a lot of Christians that don't think that way. And I'll, I'll, you know, understand I have a little bit of grace there that, you know, when you have, you get married, you know, and now you have a responsibility there to provide for your wife. I understand that. And then when you have children, you need to provide for them. And I understand that, you know, you have to have a job. You have to have some kind of an income. You have to uh, have a place to live. You have to put food on the table. You know, those are things that are responsibilities in this life in this world but you can get rather worldly and you can begin to think of of you know what do I want my child to be when they grow up well maybe you ought to ask what the Lord wants them to be when they grow up another verse another three verses here I want to uh, touch on quick Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 21 we're gonna see very much the same thing here Matthew chapter 6 verse 19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You say, is there anything positive that could come from losing a baby? Losing a little baby? Well, right there, you just read it. You know, down in uh, Argentina, after the economy collapsed down there, one of the big problems was that they would actually, there were kidnappings. People were so desperate for money, they would go into rich areas and they would kidnap children. You say, what is that? Well, a thief is breaking through and stealing, and stealing a possession that you can't replace. You know, if a thief breaks through and takes your TV and takes your computer and takes your jewelry and things like that well a lot of that stuff you can replace sometimes you'll have jewelry that's out heirloom type stuff you know and you can't replace it whatever but it's a lot different than a, a, a thief breaking through and stealing your child there's no way to replace a child well shouldn't you as a christian feel very safe when you have a, a baby that goes to be with the lord You'll never, ever have to worry about your child being kidnapped. You'll never have to worry about them getting sick and dying a slow, painful death while you stand by and watch. You'll never have to worry about them growing up only to break your heart and turn against the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a lot of parents out there that have that. They have to go through that. I know Billy Sunday, the famous preacher, two of his sons were a real grief to him. The one committed suicide. Now, what a thing to raise your children up and try to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord only to have them grow up and end up killing themselves. And I, you know, probably ended up in hell. What a terrible thing. And, you know, 
it's not fun and I'm not trying to say it'd be a good thing for God to take all the children or whatever. Not at all. But that's one positive aspect to losing a child. If you're a Christian, you know that your child is safely waiting for you in heaven. You have a treasure in heaven waiting there, safe there. Your child's never going to have to be defiled by Hollywood movies or go off to a school and have their mind warped or whatever else. Your child's never going to come home dressed inappropriately or say that they hate you or, or anything like that. You'll never have to experience that. And I know, you know, it's, it's a terrible, tragic thing, but you need to look on some of those things. But you say, okay, I can understand sometimes that there are people out there that, like David, who sin and God has to take one of their children. Sometimes there are Christians out there that aren't really thinking on eternal things and God has to take a child to make them think about eternity. But what about a Christian that is living right and that does sincerely long for heaven, sincerely walking with the Lord? What about one of those types of Christian? Why would God take their child? Well, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6, six through 9 uh, some very important scriptures here. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 says here, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Again, let me just stop there for a minute. If you are lost and you've made it this far in this message, God is nigh unto you, okay? You can get saved. You don't have to travel to some temple, some holy place, you know, wherever. No, you don't have to make a pilgrimage. You don't have to, you know, whatever. You can find the Lord right where you are at, in the very room where you are, the very seat that you're sitting in. You can find the Lord. He's near to you, and you should seek him while he may be found. You say, well, is there a time when I can't find the Lord? Absolutely, in eternity. If you die without Jesus Christ, you will live forever in eternity in hell without the Lord. No chance to get saved. Very important that you seek him while he may be found. In this mortal life that you have, you need to find the Lord and develop a personal relationship with him. I didn't say you need to find a church or a religion or a denomination. I said you need to find the Lord. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Okay? Very important. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 7 through 9 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. doesn't matter what you've done. If you're lost, God will save you through the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Verse 9 there says the heavens are higher than the earth. How much of the earth have you seen or experienced or know about? Well, you can study a lot of the earth, you can travel a lot of the earth, and you can get a pretty good understanding of what the earth is and what the earth is about. What about the heavens? Have you been past this galaxy? I don't think so. Can you explain to me what's on what the surface of Pluto looks like? <laughs> or what the surface of some other planet in another galaxy looks like? No. Well, it's the same thing with the thoughts of the Lord. Now, People say, why would God take a nine-month-old little baby? I can't explain that. Just the way I can't explain the heavens to you out way out past our galaxy, I don't know what's on those planets. I can't explain to you the mind of God. God knows things. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts down here. To us, we say, oh, it's a tragedy. It's a terrible, horrible thing. Why would God do a thing like that? I don't know. You know, people ask me stuff like that. Why would God do this and why would God do that? I have no idea. If it's not in the Bible, I can only guess. And that's dangerous to guess at the mind of Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth. 
I don't know why he does things, but his ways are higher than our ways. God knows what he's doing. You can rest assured of that. He definitely knows what he's doing. And as I said earlier, when God takes a young child, they are guaranteed a place in heaven. And I believe that's for saved couples and lost couples. I believe a, a young child that's born into a family of two lost people, I believe if that child dies young, I believe that, that child goes to heaven. And that those people, the only way that they're ever going to see their child again is if they get saved. And, you know, they'll go to heaven, they'll be with their child for eternity. But uh, you say, well, if, if God would have, if God took this little child home, why would have he have even created the child in the first place? You know, turn to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. One of the most important verses of Scripture in your entire Bible. This, you know, people say, why am I here? You know, that's one of the big questions that people, they, they ask that, and it's like this deep philosophical thing. Why am I here? You know, why was I created? You know, or, well, they wouldn't say that because that implies that there's a creator. So they say, why am I here? Well, the Bible tells you why you're here. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. Everything that's created comes from God. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. So it covers present tense. There the are and the were covers the past tense. Everybody that has ever lived was created for one purpose, and that purpose is for God's pleasure. Now, if God takes a little child home, then that child is going home because God wants them to go home for his pleasure. There's something about that child that the Lord says, I want to take this child home because I enjoy that little child. This is a very special child to me. I want them to be with me forever. I don't want to let this child live in that wicked, filthy world down there, only to be defiled by that world, only to go and die in their sins and go to hell for all of eternity. This child is so special that I want this child to come home with me. And you say, but it's our child. No, it isn't. No child down here on this earth is the exclusive property of the parent. It says right there, Thou hast created all things. The parents coming together and, you know, they don't make the child in that, in that union. That child is created by God and given to the parents. So whose right is it to take that child home? It's God's right. And if God wants to take his property, his creation home, it's up to him. And if God sees out into the future, which we can't do, we can't see out into the future. I mean, you look at the, the seven-day weather forecast, half the time they're not even right. Our best scientists and computers and all this other Doppler systems and all this, they can't even tell you what the weather's going to be seven days from now. How can you tell what somebody's life is going to be 10, 20 years down the road? You can't, but the Lord can. And the Lord can look out into the future and he can see... This event's going to happen to this child, and I love this child too much to see that child die and go to hell. So I'm going to take that child that I have created, my property, I'm going to take them to be with me in heaven. And it's not a tragic, horrible thing, because if you're saved, you can go to be with your child in heaven. You really have no reason to sorrow. Why? Well, because you're not as others that have no hope. Psalm chapter 116 verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You are here on a very wicked planet. And this is a planet that we call home, but it's not really home. Our home, our house, is to be eternal. And if you die and you are lost, your house is hell for all of eternity. If you die and you're saved... Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there ye may be also. We are supposed to go and live with Jesus Christ and be given an, immort an immortal, incorruptible 
body. That's very important. So if you are saved and you've lost a loved one, you need to have comfort knowing that they are with the Lord. And that if that loved one is saved, I need to put that in there. If you've lost a child as a Christian, then you need to understand the fact that that child is with the Lord. And even if you are lost and you've lost a child, that child is with the Lord and you need to get saved so that you can go and spend eternity with that child. But don't ask and don't get mad at God and bitter with God and say, why would he take my child? It's not your child. That child belongs to God. You know, the Bible talks about the fruit of the womb is his reward. God's children... The, the children that are created in this world all belong to the Lord. And some of them, he'll let them grow up and die and go to hell because it was their choice, by the way. But there are other children that for some reason he says, this child is very special to me, very dear to me, and precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And he takes that little baby and takes him home. Now, if you've lost a loved child... You need to think about that child up in heaven and you need to do what you can for the Lord in this life. You need to think about eternal things. Set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. Your treasure treasure, and your thoughts should be in eternity, not here. Your best life will never be here. So that's going to be it for today. Just wanted to make this little uh, short sermon to encourage those out there who are saved that have lost saved loved ones, you're going to see them again. Okay? They didn't dissolve into nothingness. And, you know, my, my grandfather that died, both my grandparents on my father's side died. My, my grandfather on my mother's side died. My grandmother's still alive. But I know all my grandparents were saved. I knew them. I heard their testimonies. They were all Christians. I don't have any sorrow. I don't see their picture and weep and, oh, I'll never see Grandpa again. I'll never see Pop Pop or Grandma. I'm going to see him again. I know I'll see him again. Why? Because I have hope. It's in a book, the King James Bible. So that's going to be it. Thank you so much for listening.